Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 773 for June 23rd, 2019. Coming up in a few minutes. If you could lift the site up and put it in, in space side, it certainly wouldn't look out of place. Um, and as I say, if I was going to be doing something in my retirement, uh, I could probably walk to the distillery. It's only about half a mile from my house. While our going distilleries backers will be starting from scratch when construction begins on the banks of Scotland's River Clyde later this year, there's a lot of experience on the team. Max McFarlane was Highland Park's whiskey maker for many years, and he's coming out of retirement to make the first Ardgowan whiskey, which will debut this fall under the Clyde Built brand. We'll talk with Max and Ardgowan CEO Martin McAdam later on Whiskey Cast in Depth. That's just ahead, along with the calendar of events, your voice, and much more. All on this edition of Whiskey Cast. Whiskey Cast, brought to you by Redbreast, the definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, know Redbreast. From far beyond the wall comes a whiskey for those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking. Winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch Whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Let's get started with the news. It's brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. We'll begin in British Columbia with the latest on a story that we've been following for a year and a half now. A provincial adjudicator has ruled against Allura and Eric Fergie, the owners of Fett's Whiskey Kitchen in Vancouver, in what's become known as the hashtag Free Our Whiskey case. Fett's was one of four Scotch Malt Whiskey Society partner bars raided by British Columbia liquor inspectors on January 18, 2018, after an undercover investigation. The inspectors seized 242 bottles of Scotch Malt Whiskey Society whiskeys from Fett's, with smaller seizures at the other three bars in Victoria and Nanaimo. All four were charged with violating B.C. regulations that require bars and restaurants to buy all of their liquor exclusively from the province's Liquor and Cannabis Distribution Branch, which does not offer the society's whiskeys through its system. Instead, the bars bought those whiskeys from two privately owned liquor stores in the province, which also have to order them through the provincial wholesaler and pay all of the appropriate taxes and fees. Alura Fergie testified during a hearing in May that she thought the bar was operating legally by going through a licensed B.C. retailer, but liquor and cannabis regulation branch adjudicator Neris Poole rejected that argument. She also ruled that liquor inspectors did not need a search warrant for the raid, on the grounds that B.C. law allows inspectors to enter a bar at any time to check inventory records and receipts. Fetz was fined $3,000, the maximum penalty for a first-time offender, on top of losing the 242 bottles of whiskey with an estimated value of almost $40,000. The Fergies are appealing the ruling— That appeal will be heard by a different adjudicator within the Liquor and Cannabis Regulation Branch. It's a mandatory step before the case can be appealed in court. In an email to WhiskeyCast, Eric Fergie claimed Poole made her decision before listening to any of their evidence, and that the ruling means the B.C. government is not required to follow its own rules or the rule of law. Rob and Kelly Carpenter, the owners of the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society's Canadian chapter, also blasted the ruling in an email, calling it fundamentally unjust, while also calling for an end to the B.C. ban on sourcing whiskeys from privately owned liquor stores. In more news of lost whiskeys, only in this case it appears to be nature's wrath instead of the regulator's, 
Cleanup work is underway after the partial collapse of a rickhouse shortly after midnight Sunday night at the O.Z. Tyler Distillery in Owensboro, Kentucky. One corner of the rickhouse caved in as a severe thunderstorm hit the area, sending about 4,500 barrels of bourbon crashing to the ground. No one was hurt, and according to master distiller Jacob Call, most of the barrels appear to have survived the storm as well. We really didn't have much breakage. You know, oak barrels are, are pretty stout, and, you know, we're still trying to kind of analyze how much actually broke, but, you know, no EPA issues, there's no river of bourbon, there's no the grass isn't even really stained. So, you know, right now it's looking pretty good. Workers will use a crane to remove the rest of the barrels from the warehouse, which engineers have determined is too unstable to enter safely. That warehouse was built around 50 years ago, but after Terracentia bought the old Medley Distillery in 2014, the company spent almost two years renovating the facility before reopening it. It was in really bad shape when we got here. We spent nearly $30 million uh, rebuilding the facility. Uh, done a lot of work on them, on all of our warehouses. So uh, they've been repaired and... Um, this particular warehouse, uh, I don't know if it's just bad luck or what, but this warehouse got hit by uh, Hurricane uh, Ike that kind of came through here and destroyed some warehouses. So it's been repaired in the past. The collapse came almost a year to the day after the partial collapse of a rickhouse at Barton 1792 Distillery in Bardstown on June 22, 2018, the rest of that rickhouse came down on July 4th, a couple of weeks later. Sazerac, the owner of Barton 1792, has never released the results of an investigation into the cause of that collapse. We'll have more on this story later on. In other news, Diageo's plans to upgrade visitors' centers at 12 of its distilleries in Scotland got a boost this week. Highland Council officials signed off on planning permission for the project at Kleinleash Distillery in the Highlands. That clears the way for construction to begin by the end of this summer. Kleinleash will be one of the four distilleries with a special Johnny Walker emphasis linked to the planned Johnny Walker experience in Edinburgh. Glen Kinchy and Kalila have already received planning approval for their expansions, while Murray Council is still reviewing the plans for work at Cardew Distillery in Speyside. Diageo is investing about £150 million in the tourism project. And here's why that's important. Scotch whiskey tourism is at an all-time high. This week, the Scotch Whiskey Association reported more than 2 million visits to distilleries last year. That's up by 6% over 2017, and spending at the visitors' centers grew by 12% to 68 million pounds. That's about $87 million. To put the growth into perspective, distillery visits in 2018 were up by 56% over 2010's numbers, and spending was up by 154% over that period. That's a lot of t-shirts along with distillery-exclusive bottlings. And at least part of the 2018 increase could be attributed to interest in the McAllen's new distillery in Speyside, which opened to the public just last June. Edrington invested around $178 million in the complex, and so far, nearly 30,000 people have visited the McAllen in the new distillery's first year. Moreg Ralf heads up the McAllen Visitors Center team. Are you surprised by the reaction so far? Absolutely. People are coming from all over the world to see this new distillery and the absolute reaction from them. They're, they've never seen anything like this. This is taking distillation to a whole different level. In what way? Because... At the heart of it, it's still a distillery. It's just everything you built around it. Can I just say, absolutely, the care and attention to what we're distilling and what we're producing there at the McAllen is the same old as we've done for many years. But this is a state-of-the-art equipment. The building itself is the most amazing, iconic building. There has never been a distillery built like this. And the roof is a one-off. 
in the entire world there has never a roof been built like this. And I spoke to the roof makers one day, I was up on that roof during construction. I have seen this distillery from inception to delivery. We've been through four years of this tearing up of the ground, building, digging into this hole, building this amazing distillery. And I was lucky enough, just about one year before it opened, when the roof was just about completed, I was up there on that rooftop with a guy who had designed and was working on the build. And he was so excited to tell me how this roof had been designed. And he was saying there has never been a roof built like this anywhere in the world. And it's been built to deal with the variety of temperature. And it can cope with one meter of snow or more. And that the weight in that snow, the roof has been dis and built in such a way that this has never been done before. And the grass on the roof now, we've got it's like a meadow. We've got wild flowers. We've got different grasses built on that roof to be green all year round. Challenging if you get a little bit of warm weather as we did last summer. We laugh in Scotland, we had three months of 20, 25 degrees, which is unheard of in Scotland. The roof took a bit of a pasting then, but it has since recovered and the roof again now is looking pretty special. I know that there have been some wags around the Speyside region that have referred to this place as Malt Disney World. They've made jokes about seeing the Teletubbies up on the hills and stuff. What do you guys think? Or at least they're talking about the McAllen, right? You know what? There is no such thing as bad publicity. <laughs> they're talking about it. We are producing still the finest single malt whiskey that you will get anywhere in the world. And we have got the most amazing way to display this. And we, we've got guides now trained in operation of this amazing new facility with all the different pillars we discuss and how this is displayed, the interactive points right through the distillery. It's actually bringing people in that maybe would not have been interested in whiskey before. So this is opening up a whole new door to a whole new raft of people, which can only be good for McAllen and the rest of the whiskey industry. And when we were building this, there was questions in the area from other visitor centres. Oh my goodness, McAllen are going to steal our visitors. Indeed not. McAllen are bringing in so many more people from around the world and they will then, they'll explore with us and then we will encourage them to visit the traditional older working distilleries because that is how we operate in Speyside. We all work together. We're extremely proud of this new distillery but we also want people to explore and see what else is out there. We are not precious in holding them all to us. She was in New York City this week for the debut of the McAllen Estate, a single malt distilled exclusively from barley grown at the Easter Elkies Estate on the banks of the River Spey. I'll have my tasting notes for it later on. One other note on the tourism front, and a clarification from our last episode. I reported last time around that Diageo's new visitor's center at the Bullet Distillery in Shelbyville, Kentucky, opened last week. Well, while the grand opening was held last week, it officially opens to the public this Tuesday. Meanwhile, Eden Mill Distillery, just outside of St. Andrews, Scotland, has filed its application for planning permission on a proposed expansion, the distillery currently produces around 300,000 liters of alcohol a year. The expansion would nearly triple that. Construction could be completed next summer if Fife Council signs off on the project quickly. You can hear my interview with Eden Mill founder Paul Miller in episode 694. You'll find it in the archives at whiskeycast.com. William Grant & Sons is giving Glenn Fittick's core range a facelift and some name changes to go along with new bottles. The 12-year-old has been named Our Original 12, while the 15-year-old Solera Reserve Edition is now named Our Solera 15. The 18-year-old Small Batch Reserves changes will be announced next year. And turning now to new whiskeys announced this week... Glen Scotia Distillery is giving its Campbellton Malts Festival bottling a wider release. The rum cask finished single malt was distilled in 2003 and bottled at 51.3% ABV. About 9,500 bottles will be available worldwide. There's no word on pricing. 
Elixir Distillers has released new batches of single cask bottlings in its single malts of Scotland and elements of Isla lineups. There are 11 new whiskies in the single malts of Scotland range, including a 1990 single cask from the old Imperial Distillery in Speyside. The elements of Isla whiskies include a 2004 peated Buna Haven and malts from Kalila, Port Charlotte, and Laphroaig. I'll have tasting notes for them soon at whiskeycast.com. The team behind Whiskey and Barrel Night events in North America is branching out into bottling their own whiskeys. Their debut release of Barrel and Bottle is a deconstruction of Balconis Texas single malt with separate bottles of the American oak, Hungarian oak, and French oak matured malts that are blended to create the final whiskey. They'll be available for around $95 each through the online retailer CaskCartel.com. Another band is jumping into the whiskey business. Slipknot is working with Iowa's Cedar Ridge Distillery to create the number 9 Iowa whiskey. Two versions, one at 45% ABV and one at 49.5%, will go on sale August 10th when the band releases its new album. And finally, last Saturday was National Bourbon Day, though we're not quite sure whoever actually declares these things. New Rift Distilling in Newport, Kentucky, tried to set a world record for the largest bourbon tasting a while back on the so-called Purple People Bridge between Newport and Cincinnati. But for National Bourbon Day, they held an interstate tug-of-war on the bridge with teams from Kentucky and Ohio. The team from the Cincinnati Parks Foundation defeated the city of Newport's 225th anniversary team. New Rift founder Ken Phillips plans to make the tug-of-war an annual event. You can keep up on the latest whiskey news all week long at WhiskeyCast.com. The news is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. Keeping American whiskey history and tradition alive isn't just a marketing slogan, it's part of Heaven Hill's fabric. When other distillers were getting out of the rye whiskey business, Heaven Hill saved the legendary Rittenhouse rye from becoming a footnote in the history books. Today it's the rye whiskey of choice, in a cocktail or neat, with a distinct spicy flavor all its own. Find out more at HeavenHillDistillery.com. Think wisely, drink wisely. Time now for the Whiskey Cast Calendar of Events. Uncle Nearest 1820 founder Fawn Weaver will lead a tasting at Binney's South Loop Store in Chicago Wednesday night, while Westport Whiskey and Wine in Louisville will have a release party for its Uncle Nearest 1820 single cast that same night. The High Coast Whiskey Festival is this coming weekend at Sweden's High Coast Distillery, along with the Aaron Malt and Music Festival in La Cranza, Scotland, and Whiskey Freedom 2019 in Perth, Australia. Speaking of Australia, Whiskey Live Sydney is on July 5th and 6th, and the Distillers Edition Dinner is on July 11th in Walkerville, South Australia. The Whiskey Rebellion Festival is July 11th through the 14th in Washington, Pennsylvania. The Proof Washington Distillers Festival is July 13th in Seattle, along with the Beer, Bourbon, Barbecue, and Blues Festival at the NAB Center in Cornwall, Ontario. Right now, we have 183 different events on our searchable calendar at whiskeycast.com. Just click on the search button to find out what's happening near you or wherever you'll be traveling soon. Grab a bourbon and settle into a good story. Heaven Hill's Backroom Stories, told by those who've rarely shared before just how they shape the spirit and just how the spirit shapes them. All the barrels are aging here. A lot of the airflow through the warehouse like this, you know, when you open a door, all that goodness hits you in the face. And, you know, it's something you never forget. Download and listen to the new podcast, Tales from the Hill, from Heaven Hill Distillery. It's coming soon to Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, 
and wherever you get your podcasts. From deep in the north, far beyond the wall, the howl of the frozen wind brings word of something new. A whiskey from the land of always winter. For those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking. Winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by Mortlock. There's a critical lesson many entrepreneurs learn the hard way. It's not what you know that matters, but knowing what you don't know and finding the right people with that knowledge to work with. That's one of the reasons why Martin McAdam went searching for industry veterans to work with him on the Ardgoan Distillery Project that's planned for the Ardgoan Estate at Inverkip, located along the River Clyde, west of Glasgow. Former McAllen Managing Director Willie Phillips is Ardgoan's chairman, and longtime Edrington whiskey maker Max McFarlane is overseeing the whiskies. In fact, he's blending the company's first mainstream release right now. As we reported last time around in a whiskey cast exclusive, Coppersmith is a blended malt that will be bottled under the Clyde Built brand and is scheduled to hit the market this fall. We'll hear from Max McFarlane in a few minutes, but I also spent some time discussing the overall Ardgoan Distillery project with Martin McAdam. Whiskey's not been part of my career up to this point in time, but I've always been incredibly interested in whiskey, and uh, I became one of the founding investors in Kingsbarns Distillery in Fife in Scotland, and later on I worked on the Ardner Merkin Distillery alongside the guys from Adelphi. So both of those things kind of said, okay, I'm beginning to learn something about this industry. And my career has been around startup businesses. So I thought it was time to start looking at creating a whiskey distillery, and that became Art Gowan. And how does it relate to the uh, estate? Well, that was one of the key things that we wanted to achieve. The, uh, you know, when you don't have whiskey, or when you're in a startup mode, you need to have a great story. The whole history of Inverclyde and the Ardgown estate and the general area on the mouth of the Clyde is just so rich in terms of heritage and provenance. And indeed, as you may be aware, there was an Art Gown distillery closer up uh, the mouth of the river at Greenock, which was called the Art Gown Distillery Company Limited. And unfortunately, that distillery was bombed by the Germans during World War II and destroyed. And then after the war, uh, it was converted to make yeast. But it was quite interesting. During the 1930s, that distillery was converted from making whiskey to make industrial alcohol. And something that we didn't know was that that industrial alcohol was used then as aviation fuel for fighter planes during World War II. So it was the original renewable energy distillery. Which is why the Germans bombed the crap out of it. Absolutely. Absolutely. They were successful. And when you read the local stories, I mean, unfortunately, the Blitz and Greenock did, uh, you know, obviously damage and kill. A number of people damaged lots of businesses, killed people, wounded people. And obviously the target was the distillery, but also the whole shipbuilding industry, which was on the River Clyde as well. So, uh, yes, the Germans attacked it for a particular reason. And the flames... They say uh, the flames continued to burn for a number of days, uh, basically acting as a beacon for more bombers to come and bomb it further. So tragic in one way, but we will have a new Art Gown distillery and we will bring some of the history of that location to place. And uh, indeed, we have reclaimed some of the stonework from the original distillery, which we'll incorporate into our new build. And when will this all take place? Well, we're hoping that we will be in construction. We've been in uh, discussions with a serious cornerstone investor now for some time, and uh, unfortunately it's been a little bit delayed. I don't think 
The UK's decision in relation to Brexit has uh, enamored overseas investors with the UK just at this point in time. So it's been a little bit slow to close out the investment, but we're pretty close at this time. So I'm hoping the investment will be closed out in the next couple of months, and then we'll move on into construction after that. So I definitely want to be in construction by the end of this year. It's about a 12 to 14 month build program. So we should be obviously then in production in late 2020, early 2021. That's what I would hope. How did you get guys like Max involved in this? Well, Max is a wonderful guy. I mean, one of the things that if you're starting up a new business, then you have to be very careful about is make sure you know what you don't know. And as I say, my career has not been in the whiskey industry. I've started up lots of businesses. But the first thing we wanted to do was to build a team. And we started building that team. Our first uh, recruit was uh, Willie Phillips, who, as you know, was the former managing director of McAllen, who took McAllen from essentially an unknown single malt to perhaps one of the greatest uh, brands in the world in terms of Scotch whiskey industry. So uh, having somebody like Willie on board was just great. And then uh, Willie and Max have known one another for a long time. We knew that Max was coming to his uh, retirement uh, from Edrington, and he lived just down the street from the distillery. So we spoke to him, and he's really enthusiastic about joining us. And Again, the knowledge that people like William and Max have, you know, it's just fantastic. And we wanted to capture some of that and have these people involved. So Max, and uh, we brought him on and he's just started working with us. And, uh, you know, we're working on our first mass release products now, which we're very excited about. The Clyde Built series, I know the first one will come out, uh, the Coppersmith, later this year. I know Max is working on that yeah. right now. He is indeed. I mean, that was one of the first things we wanted Max to do. Obviously, you know, Max is well known in the industry. He's helped us source uh, various whiskeys, and uh, we wanted to give him free reign on this. I mean, the lesson we learned from both Willie and Max is the starting point with anything you want to do with whiskey is quality. And that message, you know, they every time we we talk about what we want to do and they come back to that. Okay. It's got to be a quality product. So that's our starting point, everything we want to do. And, you know, it's very important to have a quality product out there in the market, which people will appreciate. We did our expedition release last year, but that was more of a collector's item. We did something special by taking some whiskey to the South pole, but this, the Clyde build will be our first mainstream release. And, you know, as both, Max and Willie, and particularly Max, will say, you know, a lot of the time it's easy to get people to buy your first bottle, but, you know, get them to buy a second one. That's the real challenge. So he said, if we make a great quality product, then that's a good starting point. And that's why we have somebody like Max, you know, we're giving him pretty free reign on this. Indeed, I don't think we'd want it any other way. I mean, he's working closely with our own team. We have a lady, Jessica Skelton, who's uh, doing all of the production side and the branding and marketing. So Max and Jessica are creating something that we hope people will love, and we want to be very proud of it from the start. I have to ask, because uh, there is a Clyde Side distillery in Glasgow proper. Are you concerned at all that there's going to be any conflict over the name between your Clyde built bottlings and the whiskey from Clyde's side when it comes out in a couple of years? Well, I hope not. I mean, I'm not, I'm not overly concerned about it. I mean, we, uh, we were thinking about a name before we had decided on uh, Art Gown Distillery and the location at Art Gown. One of the things that fascinated me was the whole history of engineering in Scotland and particularly the engineering along the Clyde and Clyde Built became, you know, Clyde Built as a word, a single word, um, that became synonymous with the idea of engineering quality. You know, you build it once and you build it great. And that idea of Clyde Built came into the language in Scotland. You know, it's got to be Clyde Built, meaning that it's got to be great and everything else. So we had actually gone out and registered that. Uh, trademark quite a number of years ago, I think well before Clyde Side Distillery started up. And yes, it might cause a little bit of confusion, but I think in terms of branding and what we're trying to achieve, I hope that this is going to be distinctly different from the customer's perspective. 
Now, there weren't many projects that could have lured Max McFarlane out of retirement after a career of creating whiskeys at Edrington, but this one was pretty much a no-brainer. Why get involved with a startup project? You could have written your own ticket if you'd wanted to anywhere in Scotch whiskey with all your experience. Why get involved with a startup? Uh, essentially, Mark, because the project is in my village. Uh, I know where the site is, and it's a, a fantastic site for a distillery. Uh, I think uh, if you could if you could lift the site up and put it in, in space side, it certainly wouldn't look out of place. Um, and as I say, if I was going to be doing something in my retirement, uh, I could probably walk to the distillery. It's only about half a mile from my house. Um, and also, the, I knew that the, the, the history of the area um, was, was sort of more or less in the same adage as my, my, my history, i.e., I, you know, all the Clyde built stuff, uh, the engineering, the history of the residence, provenance. The site won me over, Mark, essentially. Um, and I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I'm not. I'm not a, a whiskey maker that writes books. You know, after my retirement, I like to try and keep my keep my nose in, if you like. And obviously, Ard uh, Green offered me the chance to help out with the nosing part of the thing, uh, the the project as well. And uh, I really look forward to playing my part and uh, putting it on the map again. But you ought to write a book. As many fun whiskies as you created over the years, you ought to write a book. <laughs> Mark, they're all they're all in my head, or Mark, they're all in my nose. Um, I, I, I I've always had just this idea of this. It's simply a job. Make sure you do a good job of it. And if uh, if if you know at the end of the day, if my hard work, along with obviously a lot of other people at Edmonton, can bring Highland Park up to where it is, can bring McAllen to where it is, to bring famous Grouse to where it is, then. That's my book, really. That's my history, you know, rather than writing books. So let's talk about Clyde Built. Uh, you're working on the first blended That's malts right. for Clyde Built right yep. now because the yep. distillery doesn't exist yet. Tell me what you're creating okay. here. Well, it's, uh, it's called uh, the, 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 the Clyde Built series itself, the, the five or six different uh, variants. They're all called after uh, men or jobs that uh, are in the the uh, shipbuilding side of things, uh, Clyde built itself. The first one, which is Copper Smith, I've always, I've always uh, uh, had a great um, soft spot for first fill sherry casks. Uh, obviously, I see a lot of them in my days at Eddington, uh, you know, because of the McAllen Highland Park uh, side of things. So um, we're doing a blended malt, Copper Smith. And I'm hoping um, that it will be 100% first fill sherries, which I think in itself is fairly unique in the industry. Um, and I've been fortunate because of my my history in Eddington. Eddington have been very kind to and offered uh, uh, offered us um, a, a fair amount of first fill sherries uh, and also some uh, refills, which we may use later on in the project. But essentially, Copper Smith is three or four first fill. Um, Sherry uh, single malts that we're about to about to blend, and some American and some European oaks. So essentially, it's a, a, a mix of the different types of woods that are available, and also the the but effectively the the first fill sherry is very very important because as I, I, we only just got the sample from Edrington uh, two or three days ago, and they've been very good, and we're just just about to finish the project and get the blend put together. And then you'll be working on several other blends after that, right? Yep, yep. What we might do with Clyde Built Number Two is instead of having um, the same uh, first fill sherries uh, in uh, Coppersmith, we might think about with it and change the the, the, the like for example, Milton Duff will probably be in both of them first fill sherries, but maybe Clyde Built Number Two Milton Duff will will reduce the sherry input down in that one and maybe increase the sherry input in Craig Ellicke. So there, there I'm, I've told you two of, the, two of the single malts that are going in. You don't you have to worry about, uh, you're not going to, it's one of these things if you tell me, you have to kill me, right? No, 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 no. Okay. No, no, I've only, I've only told you two of them. <laughs> but you've also hinted that other stuff is coming from Edrington, or are they supplying or yeah, yeah. assistance Absolutely. too? So. Absolutely. And as you know, the, the, you know, and uh, of course, my first approach was to Edrington because I know of their cash policy, 
Um, and basically, I was nosing a lot of the first full Sherry cast that came on site in Glasgow anyway. So, you know, and, and I was also aware of how good they can be um, if they're in the right warehouses, the right the atmosphere, etc., etc. So, Eddington have been very kind to us and offered us quite a, quite a, a balance of sherry casks and also some refill casks, which, because of the wood policy that I'm aware of at Eddington, I would even imagine that the refills that they've offered us will be very good as well. But that's for projects further down the line. I think Clyde built one and two will be 100% fossil sherries, but we may well uh, change the 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 uh, percentage of each of them for number two. When you start making the whiskey at Ardgowan, it's going to be a lowland style. For those yep. who have not had much exposure to lowlands, because we don't have a lot of lowland distilleries anymore, although we are no. getting more now, explain what a lowland yeah. style is. Lowland style to me would be, um, well, obviously, the most common lowland uh, currently is probably Ockentoshan, even though it's triple distilled. Ockentoshan, maybe even Glengoyne, although there's some debate on whether that's lowland or, or highland. But um, certainly um, not, a, not a, a, a whiskey that has obviously any peat in it, but uh, it has to have a, a balance of you know sweetness um, and a... a, a I've I've advocated that, you know, along with Wally Phillips, I've advocated that we we should be filling a certain percentage of first fill sherry cask for our going along when it comes along. So first fill sherry cask tend to give you, you know, quite a a spicy note, quite a, particularly the, the, the European oak. The American oak will give you a vanilla sort of buttery note. So it's, it's going to be a balance. Uh, we need to try and get the spirit itself, the new spirit itself, to be uh, to marry with the, the casks. In my day in Eddington, I always thought maybe that we should work an awful lot harder, or the industry should work harder on getting a spirit that reacts favourably with the wood. Um, we do everything else, but we don't, we don't seem to do a lot of work on here we have this new spirit, will it, will it mature um, correctly in American oak or European oak? Um, so it's, a, it's an area that, that's been a, a hobby of mine to try and understand a bit more about how it matures, why it matures better in some casts in, 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 than in others. And a lot of the time, I think it's an area that's not been looked at and I think it's an area that should be looked at. So as far as our gowns concerned, I'm hoping that we can get a lowland that has a balance of a hint of space side, a hint of Glengoyne, a hint of Ockentoshan. But it has to it has to be on its own. It has to be its unique uniqueness. It's not being done by computers. It's obviously going to hopefully be done by by you know guys on site uh, taking the cut, etc. But um, essentially, a bit of everything. A bit of everything because we need a bit of space side in it. We need a bit of lowland in it because it will then react with the casks. At the end of the day, if we don't have good casks, you don't have good spirit, you can start with good spirit. If you don't put it in good casks, it's not going to be any good. Are we past the point where maybe we should consider not describing each of the five regions with their own individual style because it's possible to make almost any kind of whiskey in yeah. any of the five regions now. I mean, is there really a Speyside style or a Highland style when you can make a peated Speyside or a peated Highland or you exactly. can make a non-peated exactly. Isla? Uh, absolutely. The I'm not saying because what would happen, that would take the provenance away from the industry itself, uh, which we don't want to do, you know, from the worldwide point of view. We want to have people going to, to Isla to appreciate the, the, the peated malts. But as you know, some of the distilleries these days they can turn they can turn the tap off and make you know uh, peated peated malt next week. Turn the tap off and make another. Is it rose ale? I think it is in Diageo. They they have the they, I think they have the capacity to make almost anything that they want just as a, a flick of a switch. So to answer your question, no, I would leave I would leave the area still there. But people in the industry do know that we can make malted. Yes, we can make peated whiskey virtually anywhere we want. You bring in peated, 
peated uh, malted barley, and you can make peated whiskey almost any way you like. But, but I wouldn't suggest that we take the the um, the areas away because they're so well known worldwide. Well, I'm not saying take them away, but maybe say, okay, there's you can make any kind of whiskey in any of the regions, so there's no one perhaps uh, space side style of whiskey where you automatically assume that you're going to get that specific taste from a space side compared to a lowland, compared to a highland, uh, compared uh, to a Campbellton. Yeah. Sure. Well, what it would do, what it would do is um, if we, is it down to education maybe? Uh, you know, it's a word that I use a lot at Edmonton when people are in the sample room. We want to try and educate people uh, as to the benefits of Scotch whiskey, et cetera, et cetera. So maybe education and along just the lines of what you've said would be beneficial to the industry as well. I, you know, people should know that we can, you know, a big supplier, a big uh, supplier maybe come into one of the companies and say, well, look, we would like, you know, uh, half a million litres of new spirit, but it has to be peated. But uh, the Dessori concern doesn't do doesn't do peated whiskey at that point. Now, is that Dessori going to say, uh, no, no, we don't do peated whiskey? And and um, reject that that approach. It's a, it's open to debate. I would think that if there was someone wanted half a million liters of PT whiskey, they would um, uh, approach someone. And uh, even if they didn't do PT uh, new spirit, I think most people in the industry, as you say, now know that you can make anything you like almost anywhere. And they'd figure out a way to do it with a deal for a half a million liters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really, it's just a case of getting some peated, uh, peated malted barley, and you're not going to reject an approach to you know for that amount of business. Thanks to Max McFarlane and Martin McAdam for spending some time with us this week. We'll keep you posted on the progress of our Gowan Distillery when construction begins. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by Mortlock, whiskey's best kept secret. Hidden for decades in some of the world's most famous Scotch whiskies, comes a single malt inspired by an original for a fortunate few. Discover the entire Mortlock lineup at malts.com. Let's start off the What I'm Tasting This Week department with the McAllen Estate. It's a change of pace for the McAllen in that it's distilled using barley grown on the Easter Elkies Estate in Speyside, and emphasizes the spirit more than the casks. In other words, it's more like the old fine oak range than the usual sherry cask-dominated Macallans. This one is bottled at 43% ABV. The nose is malty with subtle spices and hints of orange, cinnamon, and vanilla. The taste has a good balance of orange and cinnamon, along with barley sugar, vanilla cream, and just a hint of honey. The taste is long and fruity with orange oil, a subtle cinnamon spiciness, and just a hint of menthol. I'm scoring the McAllen Estate a 92. Moving on, let's turn to the Orphan Barrel Forager's Keep, a 26-year-old single malt from the long-closed Pittyvick Distillery in Scotland. It's the first Scotch whiskey for Diageo's Orphan Barrel range. It's bottled at 48% ABV. The nose is fruity with red apples, hints of peaches and orange, vanilla and honey. The taste has a good balance of spices and sweetness with clove, coriander and a hint of white pepper, complemented nicely by apples, vanilla and a touch of oak. The finish is long and sweet with lingering spices and a subtle hint of oak. I'm scoring the Orphan Barrel Forager's Keep Single Malt an 89. Last month, we heard from the Balvenies' David Stewart about the three whiskeys in the distillery's new Stories range. I received samples of all three the other day. The Toast of American Oak is 12 years old and bottled at 43% ABV. The nose is sweet and fruity with hints of orange tea, clover honey, brown sugar, and hints of chocolate and charred oak. The taste has notes of orange tea, honey, hints of cinnamon, clove, and brown sugar, and a great balance and complexity. The finish is nice and long, with orange peel, honey, and lingering spices. I'm scoring the Balvenies Toast of American Oak a 93. 
Now, the week of Pete is this year's follow-up to past Pete Week editions, and like those, it's 14 years old, and distilled during the one week at the end of each year when the Balveni distills a batch of peated barley. This one is bottled at 48.3% ABV. The nose starts off smoky and ashy at first, with hints of honey, vanilla, and grilled fruits. The taste has a gentle smokiness at first that becomes more intense as touches of allspice and white pepper come alive, while honey and brown sugar notes add some balance in the background. The finish is long and smooth with a gentle kiss of smoke. I'm scoring the Balvenies Week of Peat a 93. And then there's the Day of Dark Barley. This one is 26 years old. It's bottled at 47.8% ABV. The nose is rich with dark fruits, toasted oak, gentle spices, and a hint of honey. The taste has a great balance of fruity tartness, spices, and oak, with hints of orange, baking spices, and brown sugar. The finish is long and subtle with hints of oak, dried fruits, and gentle spices. I'm scoring the Balvenies Day of Dark Barley a 94. I'm adding these tasting notes to our searchable list of more than 2,600 different whiskeys from all over the world. Check it out this week at whiskeycast.com. Redbreast fans have always cherished our whiskey's sherry notes, so we set out to embellish that character. Introducing the Redbreast Lestow Edition, a quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey finished in first fill Oloroso sherry casks from Spain's prestigious Bodegas Lestow. Carrying Redbreast's trademark pot still spices and dark dried fruit notes, the Lestow edition is graced with an enduring sherry finish that will be better described as a final act. Discover the newest branch on the Redbreast family tree. Let's open up the inbox now for Your Voice, brought to you by Lot 40. We had a lot of comments this week, especially after we reported on the ruling against Fett's Whiskey Kitchen in Vancouver, by our British Columbia Liquor Regulation Branch Adjudicator. Jordy Mosky responded with a Twitter thread calling the ruling, among other things, absolute garbage, a disgusting way to treat taxpaying businesses, and a, quote, pile of steaming poop emoji. The folks at the Last Straw Distillery in Ontario tweeted this simple response, where's the dislike button? And Ryan A. at 79 Big Poppy tweeted this from Victoria, B.C. Hats off to them for fighting the good fight and taking on Goliath. Big fan of Fets and much respect. From Facebook, Dave Mason of Vancouver posted this. It's not surprising that BCL is so buried in their ignorance and self-righteousness and perpetuate their self-serving and protectionist regulations. This needs to be heard in court. The regulations need to be updated, and the BCL bullies need a dose of reality in how to better serve their customers, from the bars and restaurants to the public. We also had a lot of comments on the Rickhouse collapse at OZ Tyler Distillery, especially after we posted photos on social media that the distillery shared of the cleanup work. Many involved crying emojis gifts of crying babies and the like, but Josh Quinn shared this comment. That's a really bad day. Can you imagine the bill to remove the remaining 15,000 barrels with a crane? Also from Facebook, this comment from Forrest Culwin, unfortunate, but could have been much worse. Nobody hurt and very little environmental impact. They will save a lot of barrels, it sounds like. From Instagram, Sean Fauché sent this comment from Texas. Feels wrong to like these photos, but thanks for sharing the carnage, Mark. Smoke Before Fire asked, why does this keep happening? And on Twitter, Andrew Leitz posted this. The next time this happens, it might not be in the middle of the night when no one is around. Luckily, no one was hurt. Twice in less than a year. Maybe Rickhouse operators should get in front of this before becoming overregulated, We'll address that in just a minute, but in the meantime, if you have something you'd like to share with whiskey lovers all over the world, you can always find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at WhiskeyCast, 
The email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. Your voice is presented by Lot 40, Canada's award-winning 100% hot still rye whiskey. Lot 40, unapologetically Canadian. Please drink responsibly. Let's wrap things up now with Behind the Label, our look at the history, science, and all that other stuff that combine to make whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Writer's Tears. And since there's been a second rickhouse collapse in Kentucky within the last year, it's worth looking at just how those rickhouses are regulated. A lot of aspects of the bourbon industry are very heavily regulated, but rickhouse construction is probably the least of those. They are all subject to building codes at the time of construction, and after the 1996 Heaven Hill Distillery fire in Bardstown, Kentucky changed its building codes to require fire sprinklers inside new warehouses, along with berms and ditches surrounding rickhouses, to keep whiskey from flowing between buildings in a fire. However, older warehouses were not required to be upgraded, and it's generally left up to distillery owners to schedule inspections by structural engineers. Of course, their insurance companies can insist on those inspections as a condition of their liability and casualty coverage. And while warehouse crews do informal inspections to look for damage on a regular basis, there are no state requirements in Kentucky that mandate regular inspections by an engineer. Now, we have to note that this is not a new phenomenon. Whiskey warehouses have collapsed or caught on fire on many occasions over the years. They are, because of their nature, a prime target for lightning strikes and the occasional tornado, and the wooden ricks inside are a prime target for powder post beetles, termites, and other wood-eating insects. The key is preventive maintenance and regular inspections. Back in March, the Kentucky Distillers Association adopted a warehouse maintenance and safety checklist for its members, along with a maintenance and use guide outlining best practices for rickhouse oversight. As we heard earlier, though, the OZ Tyler warehouse that collapsed this week had undergone upgrades and repairs in the last five years. Sometimes, nature reminds us that it can knock down just about anything we can build. If you have something you'd like us to look at on Behind the Label, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot, a unique triple distilled premium Irish whiskey combining single malt and single pot still. First fashioned in the 1700s and still a rarity today. Sure, as we say in Ireland, what's rare is wonderful. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. That's all for this edition of Whiskey Cast. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find links for our Whiskey Cast HD videos, the Whiskey Cast Tasting Panel podcast, the latest whiskey news, tasting notes, the whiskey photo of the week, cocktail recipes, and a complete archive of past episodes all the way back to 2005. We'd love to hear from you. Get in touch with us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at WhiskeyCast.com. From far beyond the wall comes a whiskey for those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking. Winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch Whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Whiskey Cast. Brought to you by Redbreast. The definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, no Redbreast. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cast Strength Media, copyright 2019 and comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening.